This is part of an interview that I did back in 2014 with John Lomax III. John has done a lot of very cool, interesting, amazing things in his lifetime. What he talked about in this particular interview was the time that he spent managing Towns Van Zandt. He shares a lot of great town stories, a lot of them I've never heard before. This is part of a much larger interview. It was put onto my podcast. I will link to that down below, and you can check it out. And um, also, my buddy Daryl makes a run in every now and then. This is my roommate Daryl. He's a huge Towns fan, so he just loves to hear the stories about Towns. But I'm going to jump out of the way, and I'll talk a little bit about John and Towns on the other side. Here are Towns Van Zant stories from John Lomax III. I had a buddy named Caddo Parrish Stuttered III. His photograph is up on the wall over there. He looks like Bill Haley with a cowlick. He came in one day and said, oh, we got to go to the 11th door and see this guy I found Towns. I said, well, why? And he said, oh, he's really good. You'll love him. Come on. So he dragged me over to this place, which was a folk club on 11th and Red River in Austin, where I was going to college. And it was one of those places where you could go in upstairs and hang around the bar, and then if you wanted to hear the music, you had to pay a cover, and you went downstairs into something about the size of this room. You could probably fit two of the 11th door showrooms inside the Bluebird. Maybe 40 people could have were there, or maybe 40 people if it was full, and it wasn't. But I was just floored. I mean, I had grown up with folk music, so I wasn't a stranger to that. But I was just t totally floored. I thought Towns was just as, as good as, or if not equal to Bob Dylan or anyone. Uh, he'd had one album, I think, out at that time. That in, that in and of itself was a real merit badge because not many of the people around that circuit had records actually out then. But he had this album out and it had a lot of the songs that we've grown to know and love for the sake of the song was the title of the album and that song <clears throat> has endured as well. But I was just completely floored. And so Caddo and I hung around afterward and went out and chatted with him and he was real friendly and flattered that we liked the music. And I don't know if he knew anything about my family or not, but whether he did or didn't, he was very easygoing. And we kind of struck up a little friendship and we'd go see him when he'd come around again. And then uh, we saw each other a few times here and there and nothing really uh, came out of it until... Uh, 76, after I'd moved up here, I had kept sort of tabs on him. He was living out in Colorado, but at that time he had fallen off his horse and broke his arm, broke his left arm. So he wasn't playing guitar. He didn't have a booking agent anymore. He'd lost the record deal by then because the record company actually had collapsed. And so he was pretty much at a low ebb. He was living, I was told, in a cabin out in the woods with no electricity and no running water or anything and couldn't gig and had no way to get gigs. And so I told him to move on over to Nashville and that, you know, between me and Guy Clark, who was his buddy from back in the day, that we'd help see if we couldn't get something going for him. And so... He moved here, and then I started managing him in 76 and put a little ad in Rolling Stone in the classifieds, a little three-line ad. It said something like, uh, World's Greatest Songwriter, call the, join the Towns Van Zant fan club, send $5 to this P.O. box. <laughs> and I just, I didn't think much of it, but we got over 100 uh responses which i just thought was staggering I mean, it was rolling stone it wasn't sing out and the other thing that astonished me was the level of intelligence of these people that responded i was used to at the time getting country fan letters which were you know sort of like crayolas on big chief tablets and 
and half the letters were turned the wrong way and the word usage was pitiful and if you were an English teacher you would have wadded it up and thrown it away but but these were letters that were heartfelt they were in many cases handwritten in this gorgeous script and that would tell in great detail how much town's music meant to these people and how some of them said it had saved their lives they were fixing to kill themselves and they listened to his record and it saved their life and all that and I was just stunned that that these were that he was reaching a, a, a really intelligent audience on a lot of a deeper level than most artists who were you know just regarded as background these were people that were listening and hanging on every word so we built a fan club and we tried to uh get the career turned around I got him set up with a booking agent here and uh he started his arm healed up and he got some shows and one of those shows was when Emmy Lou and uh, Paul I guess she was no Emmy Lou and Brian I guess she was with Brian Ahern then saw him and heard Poncho and Lefty and when she recorded Poncho and Lefty it opened a lot of doors we were able to get the label to reissue five of the first six records. And then he did another album, a new one, Flying Shoes. I uh, helped get him into that movie, Heartworn Highways. And then uh, the label that had been sitting on live at the old quarter for five years finally decided to put it out. And so it came out and that really is the definitive Towns album to this day. I mean, not only is it a double live solo record, but it's got something like 40 songs and just about every one of the great ones. But it sat and languished five years, uh, partly because of the label difficulty and partly because no one has ever known what the early album sold because it was with a label that, didn't believe in actually reporting anything to anyone. They just put the money in their pocket. And... No, that was in Texas, the part where he's uh, doing the rabbit hole and all that. that Were you was around in... for any of that? A little of it, yeah. That was in Clarksville, which was an area of Austin, which at the time was somewhat like East Nashville was 20 years ago or something. It was kind of lower-class whites and not uh, you know, a lot of... Uh, really run down part of Austin, of Austin. And uh, he was living in a little little house there, and that was where all that was filmed. Uncle Seymour, the fellow, the black guy that, that he sang Waiting Around to Die to, Uncle Seymour lived around the corner, and he had barbecues out at his place. And everyone got along great. Uncle Seymour loved having barbecues and all those hippie chicks running around without bras. And... <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so he he was just sort of one of the gang. And was that staged at all, or no, was that spontaneous? No, that was just town sitting around. Well, I mean, it was staged in the sense of, hey, why don't you get some people and have a barbecue, and we'll film it. It seems like such a beautiful, genuine moment. Yeah, no, the the moment was natural. I was there when it happened, and I was just, it, it boy, you could hear a pin drop in the dirt. It was so magical in terms of. And Seymour at the time knew he had. I don't know what it was that killed him, but he knew he was dying, and he knew it wasn't far. And uh, that he always loved that song, and so Towns sang it for him. And but there were other songs sung, and there was other stuff. And I don't know. They supposedly there's another version of Heartworn Highways coming back out with additional footage, but. Um, I haven't seen any of the other footage, but they shot a lot more stuff. And, but yeah, that was just one of those things where ooh, it wasn't like they did. Okay, do it again, and this time, see more. See if you can cry. <laughs> <laughs> right. It was that was on the fly. Bam! I saw a picture that you took of Graham Parsons backstage online. Mm -hmm. Is there a story behind that? Well, the story was that was the tour, the Fallen Angels tour, and. At the time when they came through Houston, the club was known as Liberty Hall, and Liberty Hall had this situation where the they would book acts in for the weekend, and you'd come in there and they'd play one show Thursday, two Friday, 
two Saturday and one Sunday. Yeah, six shows in all. If they were, and the room held maybe 400 people. So they booked Graham and them in, and I was writing for the underground paper, which today we call alternative newspapers. Uh, I was writing for the underground paper and also doing the press releases for the club, so I made most of the shows and and had heard Graham's album and Emmy and just thought, these guys, this is fabulous, wonderful stuff. And uh, so went to the... Uh, the gig and enjoyed it, took some pictures of the show that didn't turn out very good. But then afterward, everyone hung out up above the uh, stage. There was this huge room, the width of the club, where it was the green room, so to speak. And they had a dumb waiter down to the kitchen where you could have your drinks hauled up. And everybody hung out there, including uh, that was where I met uh, the road mangler the first time. And Jack Nietzsche was hanging out with them for some reason. Uh, the guy that I had gone with, Rocky Hill, was the blonde guy that was playing guitar backstage that you see the pictures of him and Graham. So I just started shooting pictures, and I wish I'd have shot a lot more. And the next morning, Graham and Towns and I and somebody had breakfast at the Plaza Hotel. They were staying at this really odd place, which was mainly an old folks high-rise hotel but somehow they were trying to get into the touring music business and they had put up these guys <laughs> it was just really strange not where you'd expect to find a touring band and they were touring in a bus which at the time was really unusual uh, the big acts would fly in and out and everyone else would be in station wagons or rvs but they had a bus and i'd love it if i had a tape of the chatter at breakfast but graham and towns hit it off right away and they hung out together then or? a little bit just uh yeah then, then and i think i think drugs may have had something to do with it too i think he was looking to score maybe graham was looking to score yeah, so he uh, found towns yeah or maybe by the other way around i don't know <laughs> probably graham because he would be traveling and not have a chance to keep up with the normal dealers but I'm not sure even why we went and had breakfast, but it was really interesting. And uh, Towns was, he was a big fan of Graham's, and, and I guess that may have been the first time he saw Amy Lou, which was where the uh, the live album, of course, was done, but the old quarter also was where I saw Towns sit in with the Allman Brothers. And that was one of the highlights of my life, to hear him with that full band going in a room about this size. Well, whose songs were they playing? I remember, the only one I remember was uh, Stormy Monday. I don't know if he sang more than one song or not, but I just remember him singing Stormy Monday with him, and I was sitting as close as you are to me with one Dwayne here and the other guy, what was his name, the other guitar player, Dickie, and Greg over here. With, with a, I think they didn't, I don't think they had an organ, but he had a piano, and... Uh, the two drummers going and the bass player just staggering. They had ended a tour in Houston and they had kind of fallen in with the right crowd that had drugs and girls and Dale who owned the old quarter had a bunch of room upstairs where they could all crash out. And so they just decided to set them up one night and play. And Did they know about Towns ahead of time? Were they fans? I don't know. I really don't. Probably. Because, you know, by then it was, this would have been 70, 71. So he would have had all the, the first six records out. And uh, those guys was, were digging pretty deep on stuff, too. So. Yeah, yeah, it could be. They could probably, they might have run across him, but he was really under the radar because of the label never, never did anything to help him. So I heard stories of towns playing at Douglas Corner maybe getting drunk and telling a bunch of jokes and deciding he should go across the street to Zany's and do stand-up comedy <laughs> and bomb terribly. Is that true, or have you ever witnessed that? I never witnessed it. I saw him play at Douglas Corner, though, a couple of times. And when he was on, and I mean, he could stop the room. It literally, uh, 
people you could hardly hear anyone breathe. He, when he was on and doing his thing, he was just mesmerizing. But uh, unfortunately, he, if he got to drinking, things got out of hand in a hurry. And uh, I saw him, at, I think, two different nights at Douglas Corner. No, one night at 12th and Porter, and he was kind of out of it. But then I saw him. No, no, he was fine then. And then I saw him at Douglas Corner twice. And once he just was gone to the alcohol. And once, he, I mean, he had the room in the palm of his hand. And he could have kept him there three hours. I think he played 40 songs or so. And when, you know, when he wanted to and stayed off the sauce, he could just, he was as good as anyone I've ever seen in terms of just having. Great songs, interesting patter, and people don't give him credit. He was a good, solid guitar player. wasn't flashy at all, but it was all right there, just right where it ought to be. I mean, he wouldn't be going on any silly runs or anything. It was just play it and play it and sing it and go on to the next one. Uh, I saw a couple of photos that you took of him and. And uh, Lightning Hopkins are beautiful photos. Mm -hmm. Did they get along pretty well? Oh yeah, yeah. He well, he could tell Towns was a, a good artist, and so he appreciated that Towns was really interested in him and his music. And Towns always said that it was Hank Williams, Dylan, and Lightning were his three influences. And you can hear all of them in there pretty easily, especially when. <clears throat> when Towns would do something like Hello Central, I mean, he'd cover Lightning. He didn't cover many people, but he covered Lightning. And uh, I think Lightning really appreciated the fact that Towns, Towns obviously had studied his music, and Towns told me he would listen to those records over and over and over and over, trying to you know, cop the licks. <laughs> it's deceptively simple, lightning stuff, but it really isn't that simple. Uh, but yeah, they got along fine. Uh, I got ousted as manager because I kept asking for things like contracts and royalty statements and little minor details <laughs> such as that and like who's the publisher and where's the contract and what songs and by the way how about a royalty statement or a recording contract or something that you know and uh so the guy running the label kevin eggers got towns drunk had him sign something which towns would do for a fifth of whiskey and 50 bucks and uh, I was escorted out the door and paid off, and a friend of Kevin's took over as manager, Lamar Fike. And uh, I don't think he ever did have another manager that actually cared about him after after that point. So I don't know if he wanted one. Towns was a strange guy. He was not uh, interested in pursuing art for the sake of fame and fortune. He was more of a driven artist that pursued it because he had this drive to write these songs. And here they are. I mean, they're still with us. It's, I counted once. There's only about 90 uh, that he wrote, but almost every one of them sticks like glue. That's John Lomax III talking about the time he spent managing Towns Van Zandt. John's had an amazing life. I'll, like I said, I'll link down below the rest of those stories. Daryl's a little too excited. But thank you guys very much for listening. Subscribe, share this with your friends, and I will see you guys next time.